Hi, this is Mark Kerouac, President and CEO of Bay State Health. Thanks for joining us for today's conversation about the coronavirus epidemic. I'm joined today with two of my colleagues who are leading the fight against this issue. Uh, first, Dr. Sarah Hessler, who is our system hospital epidemiologist and the vice chair of uh, medicine, uh, and also led our response to the Ebola virus outbreak uh, back in 2014. And Dr. Andy Artenstein, who's our chief physician executive and the dean of the medical school. Uh, Andy is an expert in bioterrorism and uh, stopping the spread of novel infectious agents. So we really have got a fabulous team arrayed to take on this uh, huge challenge, which may become, I think, uh, the uh, leading epidemic of the 21st century so far. So I'm going to start with you, Sarah. Uh, what can you tell us now about this virus? What do we know today? Well, thanks for asking. So this is a virus that is new to the human population, and it is a coronavirus. That is a type of virus that there are many that already infect humans, but the reason this is new is because it comes from an animal. So when animals transmit viruses to us, none of us have immunity, and that allows the virus to spread very quickly. Uh, and that is uh, what's the major concern and why it's spreading so fast. So, so tell us a bit more about how the virus spreads and why it's so good at it. Sure. So this type of virus is uh, very good at creating uh, more copies of itself in the uh, various secretions that we all produce when we get sick. So uh, our, our, uh, when we blow our nose, when we sneeze, uh, the virus gets into the droplets that we project when we sneeze if we don't cover our cough with our into our elbow or use a tissue to sneeze into or blow your nose into a tissue and then clean your hands. We have some uh, helpful example of an <laughs> alcohol hand rub that uh, is very effective at removing this virus from your hands or soap and water. Mm -hmm. So this is predominantly transmitted through people coughing and sneezing and uh, those those uh, dr droplets from the coughs and sneezes get into people's eyes, nose, and mouth if they're within uh, three to six feet or so of a person who is sick. And then it also uh, can, these droplets can land on flat surfaces. And then a person who is not yet infected could pick up some of the virus from one of those surfaces. And then if they touch their eyes, nose, or mouth, could take it from the surface and put it into one of those places that then the virus will uh, transmit. So this is a really great example of how we can, again, stop the spread of this by um, cleaning our hands all the time. As, and so as, a, person as who's a, a person infected with this virus could get it on their hands just by touching their nose or mouth as well, right? Correct. Yeah. So Andy, this is a real challenge for us. What has Bay State done to kind of get ready as a system? Well, great question. On a daily basis, even without a viral epidemic bearing down on us, Bay State operates under a steady level of preparedness because every year, as I think our audience knows, we have outbreaks, although we consider them regular occurrences of things like the flu and common colds and other such things. So we're prepared on any given day for this. This ratchets up the level of preparedness, of course, and we Thankfully, five or six years ago, as you mentioned, had some good experience preparing for the Ebola outbreak, which was relatively contained in the United States, but the risk was felt to be quite high and we had to be ready. Uh, Sarah did a lot of that good work back then, and that good work is serving us well now. We've done a, done a number of things. Some of them are the same things that our national authorities and regional authorities are recommending around social distancing and ways to keep our population and our team members and our patients less likely to come into contact with folks who are infected with this novel virus. Even with that, the kind of social distancing we've heard about and read about, reduced number of people at meetings, more virtual telephone and other type of meetings and conferences, uh, reduced day-to-day uh, -day interactions with large numbers to the extent possible. Even with all of those things, though, uh, there are additional things that a healthcare environment has to consider. One of those uh, is the overall planning around hospital operations, outpatient operations, what, what our patients 
do when they uh, have questions or feel ill. And so we've developed a, uh, a sort of rapid fire plan on how to organize that. And that's called the incident command structure. So, so there are some new protocols about if somebody feels sick in the community, how do they actually get in contact with the health system? Well, for us, thankfully, our contact center is the point of contact for many of our patients out there in the community, those who aren't ill enough to need to go to an emergency department. And that is really most patients uh, mm -hmm. in this setting. And the vast majority of patients will seek information from our website, which has uh, been updated and is updated on a daily, if not multiple time day basis, and is really current and links a lot to the state and federal authorities and their guidelines, as well as uh, calling into our contact center will lead to a process where questions will be asked and their needs will be addressed in a variety of ways to make sure that they get the most up-to-date care and information. Yeah. So, Sarah, I'm guessing even with all these preparations, we're going to be dealing with a lot of these cases in a very, uh, very near future. Could you tell us what we're getting, what we're doing to get ready for the surge? Sure. So, um, we have uh, been preparing for uh, <coughs> for several months in order to be able to handle a potential influx of patients that uh, may need our care. So we have uh, prepared uh, special areas in the emergency department. We're screening all of the patients who come into the emergency department for symptoms. If they have symptoms, they're being isolated immediately. If uh, they uh, need to be admitted to the hospital, they're again being admitted on isolation. And we've prepared several special units just to care for this type of patient. Mm -hmm. And um, we have been really struggling thus far with testing. So could you say a few things about sure. how yeah. we test for this virus and what it's like today and maybe what it might be in a few weeks? Right. right. So this is a really hot topic and uh, many people would like to be tested and uh, we would like to, to have the capability of testing as many people as possible. Uh, currently at Bay State Health, we don't have the capability to test uh, the patients for the virus ourselves. We have been partnering with the Department of Public Health to, uh, to assist us with uh, testing patients that need to be hospitalized uh, and working with either the Department of Public Health or a lab that's capable of testing hospitalized patients for this virus. So people with minor illness, we just don't have enough test kits right now. Correct. Yeah. We Yes, we uh, that is the, the current uh, capabilities. We, again, are partnering with the Department of Public Health, who is really helping us to understand who should uh, these limited numbers of tests uh, be performed on. And as we uh, open our capability when there is FDA clearance of the testing uh, kits that would make it a uh, possibility for individual hospitals to be able to uh, test for this virus, then we will you know, be able to uh, consider a much wider spread testing in our community. But until that time, uh, we simply don't have the capability. Mm -hmm. Andy, there are certain things that are common in all epidemics. So what would you predict is going to be the course of this epidemic in our community? Well, again, a great question and one that is being discussed nationally almost every day. Uh, I think there's one thing that's for certain, as Sarah said, this is a new virus to humanity, but certainly new in the United States. Therefore, there's a very uh, immunologically inexperienced population with this virus. So there's going to be a time where there will be a lot of infection. The exact number we don't know, but it will spread through the community. It already is uh, at a different level. Some people are probably close to asymptomatic and some people have mild symptoms. Others may be quite sick, especially those that are more vulnerable, like the elderly and those with other lung conditions or heart conditions. But once a number of people start getting infected, especially at the lower, milder illness level, we'll start to also spread immunity throughout the population in our community. As that occurs, the epidemic will peak and then begin to recede. The timing on that, that's unclear. Yeah. Uh, but we're probably talking realistically weeks and months. Yeah. And so this is not going to be uh, around forever, but it, it's possible it could come back in future years if there aren't enough immune people in the population, right? That's correct. I think it's important for people to understand that uh, I was thinking about this as recently as this morning, with all of the things that are happening in our society, events being changed or postponed or canceled, people changing their own travel plans, I think it's important for people to realize that's a temporary situation. 
Uh, how temporary? We're probably talking again weeks to months, but it's not going to last forever. But it is the smart and prudent thing to do at this point. Yeah. And a year or two from now, I'm guessing the testing area is going to be far more common, far yes. more prevalent, and we may even have a vaccine or treatments, right? Correct. Yes, yes. And uh, um, the uh, CDC is uh, telling us that they're actively working uh, globally. Several uh, areas, pharmaceutical areas, are working actively to create a vaccination, but that we can't expect that uh, at least for p possibly a year to 18 months. Yeah. So these strategies that Dr. Artenstein is referring to are ones that are helpful for us now. So social distancing, cleaning your hands, um, and preventing the transmission of virus to yourself. Yeah. So really, in the short run, we're yeah we're talking about kind of old-fashioned approaches to epidemic control, and I've been following this with interest as a retired infectious disease guy myself. That really some of these old-fashioned methods really do work, and our ability to kind of keep a lid on this infection is going to be critical. I think what I've noticed is that the countries that either weren't aware that the virus was there or didn't pay enough attention to it, or even the areas within our own country that were some of the first hit, like Seattle, uh, it could overwhelm the health system. So it's mm -hmm. important for everybody uh, to really do your part and to work with us to follow these guidelines uh, and really partner with the experts uh, so that we can keep a lid on this and, and really minimize its impact on our community and on Bay State Health. I really um, want to compliment you on getting ahead of this uh, and thinking through a lot of the different aspects of things. I think it's been very impressive to see uh, how the team has come together, and it's really a credit to both of you guys. So thanks very much. Thank you. And thanks for joining us, uh, and I'm sure we'll be talking again soon.